Welcome to the Pretty Powerful Podcast, where powerful women are interviewed every week to share real inspiring stories and incredible insight to help women or anyone break the barriers, be a part of innovation, shatter the glass ceiling, and dominate to the top of their sport, industry, or life's mission. Join us as we celebrate exceptional women and step into our power. And now, here's your host, Angela Gennari. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Pretty Powerful Podcast. My name is Angela Gennari, and today I am here with Annika Jackson. How are you, Annika? I'm pretty good. Thank you. It's so nice to be here, Angela. Absolutely. Thank you for for being here. So um, as a MARCOM executive and instructor at the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism and co-host of USC's Mediascape podcast, Annika's knowledge of the intersections between public relations, branding, and digital media management is a perfect match to elevate results for brands. She serves on the advisory board for the UC Santa Barbara Women in Leadership Executive Program, is a member of Intuit's Small Business Council, and contributes her knowledge and thought leadership for the benefit of multiple local, national, and global organizations. Attica launched the Your Brand Amplified Business Podcast in 2020, which has ranked in the top 0.5% of podcasts. That's amazing. That's really cool. (laughs) That's so cool. So I love talks about branding because I feel like it is one of the most important things that we can do for our business. And um, I can become kind of a stickler about branding. Um, so my employees are, you know, they they come up with ideas and I'm like, looks great, but can we just make it brand compliant? <laughs> like, can we just, <laughs> you know, oh, I, ma- I made this new marketing folder or a flyer. Okay, great. Can we just make sure our brand colors are in there? <laughs> can we make sure? That- oh, yeah. So like even we even had these like fun cost custom golf shirts or excuse me, bowling shirts made for an event that we attended. And I was so adamant that everything be brand compliant, like with colors <laughs> and even like, I'm like, that lettering doesn't look quite right. Like it was, uh, I probably did like 15 revisions, but oh, no. I understand but the value. That, oh yeah. Well, and that's the beauty of having accent colors, secondary yeah. colors, all of that yeah. to make, add that little spice when yes. you need to. So I love that we're going to talk about branding and PR and marketing. I think all of those things are just so, so, so important and we don't talk enough about them. So let's start. I just want to find a little bit more about you. So what made you want to go into branding? Oh, wow. Uh, I think like almost everything, I kind of fell Mm -hmm. into it. Okay. (laughs) So I grew up in Kansas and Uh there wasn't a lot to do. So when I was in high school, I would go dancing uh, with my girlfriends and like, go listen to music, go to can drive to Kansas city for some yeah. excitement. In our lives. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, at that point, I, a friend of mine said, Oh, this DJ would like you to start promoting them. And I was like, Oh, that's hmm. cool. I never realized that was a thing. Right. Uh-huh. And, um, so I started promoting DJs and different events and that way I got in free to the shows Ooh, and that good. kind of just snowballed. I started a little zine. I had my own club nights. I started throwing parties and that parlayed me to a move to Chicago to work for Kevin Bergen Associates Marketing and work on a lot of different accounts from Audi to Smirnoff and Camel when people still smoked in bars. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Aging myself a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and then I moved to LA, worked for KBA out here, and then started working at a magazine publisher. And I was using really more in the experiential marketing space and learning as I went. Uh-huh. Then I started working more with like programs for advertisers and putting together different packages and really thinking about brand and how you portray your brand, whether it's to advertisers or consumers and create that sweet spot for both of them to connect. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what it really is, is my journey has always been about connection and helping people find collaboration points and bringing people together. Yep. And I didn't really even realize that was brand at the Mm -hmm. time. And, you know, I, I have had a few other moves um, I'm in LA for the third time now okay. after San Francisco, LA, Houston, and back to LA. <laughs> and what I realized is that and I've collected people from every place I've lived, from all the uh-huh. different experiences and jobs I've had. And be- it's part of my personal brand it's because mm-hmm. I like to be intentional about those relationships, but it's also helped me get work. And I've also been able to see, oh, even though I don't live in that city anymore, people remember who I am because of how I acted. Yeah, I showed up and they'll hire me for that. And so it was really eye opening to just 
I mean, that sounds really silly, but to realize that I could be hired on the merits of the work that people saw me do Mm -hmm. and not just having to be in the community or be in all of the publications or be at all of the events, which is a very Houston thing, by yeah, the way. So, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you're in the South. So. Uh-huh, yes. Um, so we, we yeah. love to connect in the South. It's all about, yes. you know, those interpersonal yes. relationships that you have. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I could not agree with you more. And I think that's beautiful. And I think that's also probably where your podcast came from is that just desire to connect and, you know, wanting to share information and wanting to make sure everybody is kind of like, um, you know, you're kind of sharing some really great insight with people. I love that. So yeah, but I, I am a big believer in building a personal brand because your personal brand follows you everywhere you go. And so, you know, whether I'm leading a company or a networking organization, like I want my brand to be not just my company, but, you know, who I am, my values, what I stand for. And that consistency is throughout everything I do. And so I tell my employees, (laughs) I want to be so consistent in everything that I do that, you know, what my response is going to be before you ask the question. I, that's so, this is like music to my ears (laughs) because I I think people forget that when, especially when you're starting a business, yeah, your brand, your business brand is you. Yes. Yeah. And, Mm -hmm. and if there is a difference, we we've seen it time and time again, whether it's in politics or in the business world. When brands say one thing and then the people behind the brand say something completely different, oh, yeah, yeah, they lose trust. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, it's and it's your your words matching your actions. You yes. know, so I was just thinking the other day what a brand nightmare this is because with the whole Boeing thing, you know, with with everything that's happening with Boeing, you have the CEO talking about how safety is his number one priority, and you know all of these things, but none of the actions that he has had have been in in alignment with that brand. And so, you know, what he's saying and what he's doing, you know, what he's putting his money behind, what he's putting his, you know, intentionality behind is not safety, it's shareholders. And so not to go on a soapbox about Boeing, but it was just (laughs) to me, it was like, that's the epitome of losing trust. When you don't align with what your words and your actions don't align, you're going to lose trust all day long because you no longer have a brand. You know, you're, 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 you're not compliant with, with what you're saying you're doing. Well, I could totally go on a tangent about this because (laughs) I think so many of the big companies, especially with AI now, right? Yeah. Seeing that um, there's been a lot in tech, in the world of tech and in aerospace as well. There's a lot of ask for forgiveness, yes. right? Let's rush and get things done. And we're not going to care as much about privacy or safety or other issues. Yeah. Yeah. Or behold it to these other people, our shareholders, which mm-hmm. usually the are majority shareholders in a lot of these cases. Yeah. And, and so I think we're seeing this time and time again, where you see people get fines or companies get fines, but then it doesn't really matter because they have so much money mm. and market share that, you know, uh, people are beholden or companies still have to use them and there's not a great alternative. Uh, and that's why I think people look to be more invested, especially when they're working with smaller brands, with small to medium-sized businesses, because mm-hmm. they they're like, we may not be able to trust those bigger brands that we kind of, you know, an Amazon, like, yes, I yeah. order from Amazon often, <laughs> right. but you know, some of the things that they do are not always great, but I know I want to be really intentional in my yeah. actions words, my deeds show up with my values and everything I do. And I want to make sure people who work with me or partner with me seem the same thing consistently. Yeah. 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 Well, and you know, it's, it's in everything that we do, even parenting, you know, even parenting. And I actually had this conversation with my son yesterday because we were talking, he's 17 years old and we were talking about something where, you know, there was a child that was acting up a lot and the mom kept threatening, Oh, you'll lose your phone. Oh, you'll do this, you know, whatever it is. And I'm like, okay. And when she did it again, did she lose her phone? Well, no. And I'm like, that's branding like that. That's, you know, not being consistent. I was like, you if you don't know what version you're going to get and then all of a sudden you you threaten 10, 10 times, you don't lose your phone. And then all of a sudden they snap, you know, they take the phone, everything goes crazy, everything burns down. And now, you know, the 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 kid is thinking, well, they're really crazy. <laughs> and it's like, had you just been consistent from the start, you know? And so again, it goes back to consistency and branding is all about consistency. It's all about, you know, you should know what that brand's, you know, uh, uh, values are before you ever even have to ask, you know, like you, you should already know they should just be that consistent. Exactly. And 
totally going to share a story about my kids. Yeah, please. <laughs> Daughter 16 and she's, we've always done volunteer work together oh, and we've always awesome. shown up in that way. And uh, something that happened the school year was mm -hmm. there are a lot of books being, we have, we're in a public school district, but it's a very wealthy one uh -huh. where they have a lot of books that they just get rid of. And she saw this happening in several departments and she made it her mission to rescue the books because she's like, Aww. oh, well, my mom will know somewhere to donate those to. So three times this year, I've had to go up to school and fill my car with books <laughs> and figure out, okay, where, <laughs> where are we going to donate these? Because textbooks, not every nonprofit will take them. Sure, Some we yeah. might want to send overseas. But because she knew that she loves reading, I love reading. And she also knows that this is something that's part of our nature and our heart is mm. we don't want those books to be put in the dumpster. We want to make sure that they find a good home because there are a lot of people who don't have that access to those books yeah. that could use them. Uh, and so that to me, I was like, ah, oh, I must be doing something right because that is she's, awesome. She's, you know, she's doing that and she sees that that's something that's important to me. So it's important to her. Yes. And I love that she already expected that you would already know and that you would be <laughs> on board. And that says that says so much about you and, and your relationship with her and, you know, what you've been able to convey and, and what your values are. So that's amazing. I love that story. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when you're talking about branding with companies, and this is this is where it gets really tricky. Everybody wants to create a brand, but they're like, "Well, what does that mean? Is that just a logo? Like, tell me what a brand is." Yeah. Uh, that's so many people think it's a logo. So yeah, many people yeah. think it's colors, and yes, that that's your brand identity. That's such a big part of it. Mm -hmm. But I try to be really intentional, whether it's a podcast or a business or whatever you're putting out into the world. Yeah. Take yeah. the time to take a step back and think about why are we here? What is mm. the purpose of this business, of this service? Uh, you know, and most of us, it's because we saw a hole in the market. Yeah. Um, so that, that we're like, okay, we can't find this. So other people can't find this or, mm -hmm. oh, we can do this a little better or differently. Uh, so you need to know, be really clear on your purpose and then figure out what your vision is. What will the world look like mm -hmm. once you've enacted this purpose? And then the mission is the tangible day to day. Here are the tactics and here's what we're going to do to enact what this vision to life. Mm -hmm. And then as you, and then purpose, values, all of those things, the brand blueprint is so important to build a strong foundation before you move on to the colors, mm -hmm. before you move on to the fonts, before you move on to the accents. Um, because the, the other thing with color is that there are colors that reflect different things, but mm -hmm. if the color green would be important for your business, but it's not a color that you love yeah, and you, that you see yourself in, then don't use that color. <laughs> like find yes. another color that's similar, that has, you know, the same messaging or two colors that you can put together. Uh, and so I think people usually think about that first and they might think about colors that are, that may or may not work with their brand, but mm. you really have to go back and start with who are you? Why are you here? What are you bringing to the world? What will people get out of working with you or buying your product or service? And if yeah. you have that nailed, that everything else becomes so much easier. Your customer personas, how you're going to message to people, what social media platforms you should be on, who mm -hmm. you're going to speak to, what podcasts you want to be on, or what you know publications you want to be interviewed in. Mm -hmm. All of that just clears up. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you start with the values of the business first. You know, you start with values and why are you here and what are you doing before you get to the logo? Because you, can't, you can, it almost would make more sense to develop all of that and then communicate to the person that is designing the logo. This is what we stand for because it will inspire them to come up with a logo that reflects that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I Nowadays, it's so easy. People go on and I, I do it too, right? We uh -huh. go on to Canva, we go on to different yeah. platforms and we fig find some, oh, we like that and that and that. Okay, that looks good. Yep. But uh, taking that step back and it, it helps with the intentionality. It helps you find yeah. that little extra zhuzh that you're going to put into the logo mark mm -hmm. or to your tagline mm -hmm. that you wouldn't find if you start with a logo. And it's the same thing with PR, with marketing in general, right? People come to me and said, I'm ready for PR. Like, what's your brand? Yeah. Well, I have a, I have a website. Right. what does it say? Like, who right. are you? What What do you really want to bring into the world? Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a book that I love called Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And um, I actually give it to my, my team. And, you know, it, it's a really big part of how we communicate about our business, because, you know, 
I own a security and event staffing company, and we generally are not the the cheapest, you know. And in fact, I, we're never the cheapest. We're we're always we're kind of a premium service. But you know, the reason that we're able to go in and still get new clients is because we don't start with you know the what we do. We talk about why we do it, and the why we do it, and the values and the mission and all of those things are what make us a premium service. You know, it's, it's why, you know, why would you want to do business with us versus our competitors? And it's the why, you know, it's the why we do what we do. And and that's where people usually get things wrong. They want to put everything that they can offer somebody up front and center. Yeah. Well, that's great. But how does it differentiate you? So starting why and really being able to speak to that, I can completely understand Mm -hmm. why some walk in and feel so much more comfortable working with you than with five other companies that might mm-hmm. offer similar services, but they don't start yeah. there. Right. Yeah. yeah. They're looking at it as a transaction instead of a relationship. You're building a relationship. Right. Right. And, and we're not just selling them on the idea of having security services. We're, we're, you know, selling them on the idea of having a partner who cares about safety and it's a different, it's a totally different mindset. You know, it's, it's, we're going to work together to create the safest, most hospitable environment. And, you know, not just, we're going to put a security guard on that door. (laughs) Anyone can do that. (laughs) And so, yeah, we really try to differentiate ourselves through our values and not just through our tasks. Anyone can do the tasks, you know, so, but (laughs) so when we talk about, you mentioned PR and people wanting to go into PR, when is the right time to go into PR as a small business? Oh, I am a big believer in what we call the peso model, which uh-huh. is celebrating 10th anniversary this year. So exciting, um, which is paid, earned, shared, and owned media. Okay. And even though it starts with paid, the first part is really the owned and okay. then the earned. So the owned media is your website, okay. your email list, what you put on your blogs. Shared media would be how you're sharing on social media, for instance, or how other mm. people are helping share your message. Okay. Earned. Earned media, I know I'm going a little backwards. Earned media would be interviews, PR, mm-hmm. publicity, but also it could be reviews that you get. Ah, okay. Party yeah. websites, right? Yeah. Other people validating that you are who you say you are. And then paid is, of course, paid advertising, direct messaging. And so I always think they all need to be part of the mix. Yeah. If you start with owned and shared, of course, you want to make sure you have a great presence so that mm-hmm. when you get earned media, People can find you, see that you really are this wonderful company that Mm -hmm. they've read about. And then you can turn that into paid advertisements too, especially if somebody else is saying something great about you. So for me, I don't think it's ever too early to start with PR because I also think a lot of people who start businesses aren't necessarily comfortable talking about themselves. And so I want to get them out of, it's not really about you. It's really about what you're providing to the world. Right. 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 Absolutely. So the why. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So if, you, if you take yourself, take the ego part out, then it becomes a lot easier. But also people usually need a little time to warm up to speaking their message. Yeah. And so I like to start with smaller publications, with smaller mm-hmm. um, podcasts or event, local you know, events, maybe just speaking to a class of students so that you really get used to sharing. And then you see how people react and then, you know, and then you feel more confident and comfortable and yeah. then you can go on bigger platforms. Mm-hmm. And so I always look at it as kind of like being a child. Um, you know, you learn to crawl and then mm-hmm. you learn to walk and then you learn to run. Mm-hmm. And I look at PR as the same thing. So I was just talking to somebody earlier today and she said, well, when is a good time to start book pu- publicity Ooh, when it's out? Yeah. I said, no, no, no. You need to start way before. You need to make really? sure that um, if you have a book coming out, you're telling people about it. You're maybe sharing little snippets. You're yeah. teasing it. You're getting people to sign up for your mailing list, right? For mm-hmm. pre-orders. Mm-hmm. So then they, you can send them a thing. Okay, today's launch day. Here's my special link on Kindle for 99 cents or whatever you're doing to entice people to try to get to bestseller status if that's one of your goals, right? So right. you think about what your goals are. But I do think that it's always a great time. And also, we you know, doing podcasts, doing interviews, It's not like this is going to come out tomorrow. (laughs) So you want to make sure that you have some, you've been practicing your skill set and that you have some things coming out 
when your product service book is going to launch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. So yeah, because I was always under the impression that if you didn't have anything newsworthy, then you know, you don't have PR. But I guess when I you know, when you're when you're talking about it could be your website, it could be, you know, reviews, if we have a great, you know, a customer that has a great experience, then encourage them to write a review. And you know, I love that it's not just press releases, because that's what I had always thought of when I thought of PR. Yeah. And that's in the world of press releases, there are so many backlinks in the world. Yeah. Right? So they're they're great for SEO, but it's very seldom nowadays, unless you partner with one of the bigger press release services that you're going mm. to get journalists actually looking and you know, reaching out to you from a press release these days. Mm, yeah. Um, so they are good, but all of this other stuff, the other other the interviews do build up SEO value as well. And yeah. you know that's really important these days, especially with more traffic and some people use social media search and video search and AI and all these different things that are coming about. So you still want to make sure that your message, your why is what people find and it's not somebody else's. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So I, I have found that, you know, sometimes I'll have, you know, one creative agency design our website and then a different creative agency will go do our print materials and and there's a misalignment there you know and so you almost want you know I like that you're you're talking about this as just a, a whole package you know the whole package should just really flow together yeah yeah and it doesn't have to be the same teams right maybe yeah. specialties but you have to at least they have to be in the room and understand yeah you absolutely instead of looking at it from their own construct. Right, right, right. So when you're doing PR and you're doing branding, um, when do you start? Like, what what do you find to be the biggest bang, bang for your buck when it comes to small business marketing and advertising? Like, where where should a small if a small business doesn't have a huge marketing budget, right? So, how what would you say um, would be the best use of money and the biggest ROI mm. for a small <laughs> business with a small budget? That is, that's a hard one, but I would say thought leadership right now okay. is, it's a buzzword, but it is also really important. So yeah. even if you're just, you know, obviously depending on what your business is, mm -hmm. find a social media platform that most of your audience will be living on. Um, I always get the, your, the, the names for all the others, but really yeah. focusing intentionally on one platform. So for instance, LinkedIn, that okay. is a great place right now. I think people yeah. are really seeing that oh my gosh LinkedIn has been really undervalued for the connections you can make mm -hmm. on it and how you can find people and now they have the cl collaborative articles where you can add your thoughts to an article in your field and position yourself as a thought leader and it's free yeah right? yeah I love it I love it well and you know just small speaking gigs like every conference that you go to in your industry they're always looking for speakers to just talk on a topic you know whether that topic is you know something very specific to what you do you know like if I wanted to talk on a security topic I could mm -hmm. submit when they when they have a call for speakers you may not get paid for it because it might just be something where like you might get a free conference registration but it's getting yourself out there and making yourself be a thought leader like you were saying that's yeah. that's really really a smart move and, and if you don't have big budgets but you have time or you have an yeah. assistant mm -hmm. you can also there are a lot of great Facebook groups where oh, yeah. you can google podcast guests and you'll a whole bunch will come up that have groups that you can join where people are looking for podcast guests mm -hmm. you're going to have to be active and go in and search right but that's a yeah. free way to get started on that journey there are free versions of matchmaker.fm and other platforms and so there are so many resources and tools right now mm -hmm. to get pr that don't cost anything if you don't have as if you you have to figure out what your investment is right yeah like yeah. in the world uh, time treasure talent mm -hmm. so you if you don't have one then you need to focus on the other two yeah. um so that you can start just seeding things and find people with small publications, there are so many women's publications out there. Mm -hmm. If you just go on their websites, you can learn how to submit an article or learn how to put yourself up for a potential interview. Yeah. And they they all need content. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Really good advice. Thank you. So who inspires you? Because I mean, there's so much that you probably, you know, are able to give to people in terms of inspiration and advice um, and guidance, but who inspires you? Well, my mom, 
always. Yeah. <laughs> my mom and, and my daughter. Oh, um, I love that. Yeah. My mom came over from Thailand when she was um, 18, 19 to go to university, right? Yeah. Had this whole adventure, um, had to just be a really strong, resilient person. And I think growing up, I always thought she was just this quiet woman. Mm-hmm. And then I see how my dad's friends would talk about her and how much they respected her. And it, wow. and then I turned 18 myself and moved away. And I was like, oh, okay, now I get it. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh, my mom is an amazing. <laughs> she's a saint. And uh, I've really tried to emulate so many things that she does. Even though she was a working mom, she always made us, you know, breakfast and she always made time for us and was really intentional. She also oh. gave back to the community um, and just really pours so much caring in. And so I've tried to model that. And then my daughter is so different than me in so many ways. She is, in some ways, we're the same. She's very driven, but she's known for years what she wants to do when she grows up. And to have that mind and that capacity and just, yeah. I love seeing the way her mind works and being able to support her on that journey and see who she's becoming. Mm-hmm. Um, and so really the two of them are my biggest role models. That's amazing. So it looks like, you know, it sounds like philanthropy and volunteering is really close to your heart. So can you tell me about some of that and some of your passions and and, and how you've gotten involved with different organizations? Um, absolutely. So one of my favorite activities was being president of Junior League of Los Angeles. Um, and this mm-hmm. was 14 years ago. <laughs> yeah. But that organization is such a training ground. It really is about providing committed volunteers, trained mm-hmm. volunteers to communities. Mm-hmm. And I learned so much, not that just for the volunteer world, but that I took into the business world oh, of really? how not just to, how to be a leader, but how to be a good leader, how to be a manager, how to really listen to people, how to make sure other people had autonomy mm-hmm. and could learn to do their jobs and their roles in their own way, not the way that I would do it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Learn how to lead teams of people, to create budgets, so many different skill sets. And then Mm -hmm. that really helped shape what do I want to do next? And so out of that, some fellow members and I started Learn, Grow, Lead, which focuses on children in Cape Coast, Ghana. So we started out a little over 15 years ago, helping fund education. And then we built an orphanage. It's not really a traditional orphanage, but it's a home for kids who don't have a home okay. right um and so they have a safe place to stay um where they'll be cared for where they can go to school where they'll have meals and things provided for them um and then we also found we got a grant and we rented 10 acres of farmland for self-sufficiency for our partner organization and out of that now they have that land but we've been able to purchase 10 acres Wow. A little closer to the orphanage as well. And so within a couple of years, they should have complete self-sufficiency, which is always the goal. Nobody wants to depend on a hand out. They mm-hmm. want a hand up. Mm-hmm. And it can be really volatile, particularly in a lot of developing countries um, where we, if we think inflation is bad, you don't, we don't know anything compared to yeah. countries over there yeah. where it's, it's just so different. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's one of the things that I'm really passionate about is just I I know it's only a a few hundred people that we're making a difference for over this time period, but if we can help spark change and help, you know, somebody else get an education, help them not become a victim of trafficking or labor and be able to inspire them to inspire others, that's all you can ask for. And and so that's- that's so beautiful. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So, so it was it difficult to start a nonprofit in another country. Was that really challenging, or did you start it here and then it's just it serves over there? How does that work? Yeah. Yeah. So there is a partner organization that is a registered nonprofit in Ghana, okay. run by Ghanaians. Um, it is, and then we have. I said, well, if we really want to get funding from U.S. donors, we need to show transparency. Mm-hmm. We need to show where mm-hmm. their money is going. We need to show results. We need to make sure they can get a tax deduction in the yeah. States. That's important. That is important. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we started a 501c here that okay. then would help serve over there. And then our, our intention was to hopefully be able to serve other, you know, nonprofits as well in other areas. But it's it's so hard to move the needle a little bit in one area, especially when you're a very small, all volunteer run. Yeah. Nobody makes any money. You know, we're just piecemealing the budgets together every year going, can we pay for 
not just the kids in the orphanage to go to school, but these other 50 kids who really need an education, who have families to live with, but can't afford to pay the fees. Yeah. So it's every year, it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, wow. You do what you can and you, we do our best. Um, and it is it is not too difficult to start a nonprofit, um, but it is, you know, you have to really keep on top of are they, is it going through the process? Is there paperwork that they sent us that we missed? Mm. And there's the client start. Um, and I they just called me and said, not the client, the government, and said, we sent pa- something back in, August, in April uh, with questions that we needed answered so we can approve your status. And I think it went to one of her, you know, to her address, but she's so busy. Um, mm-hmm. We have been able to connect and I'm like, okay, so we, you should have the status already, but we need to make sure this is taken care of. Right. So, you know, you just have to keep on top of things. You have to make sure you're getting the paperwork done. So mm-hmm. there is it's like running any business. Yeah. Things that, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, well, I love that you, you have the, the organization in the U S and you have a local organization in Ghana. And I think that's really the, the key to success in a local, you know, economy like that, because there's a, there's a book called half the sky. Have you ever heard of it? That is, oh my gosh. Can't believe you just said yes. <laughs> when I read that book. I was ending my presidential term for junior league, and uh-huh. that solidified. It's like ah, oh, education, healthcare, yeah. Yes. And those, if you have those two things, then people will not get married as young. They won't be yeah. victims of trafficking as much. Right. Right. Yes, that book was my inspiration. It's a, it's a game changer, isn't it? Like it, it just made me think about everything so differently and like where money goes and, you know, how to be successful in those organizations. But, you know, one of the points of the book is that you need these local grassroots organizations to partner with because Red Cross can come in, but, you know, people don't trust it, you know, and, and you have a, a U.S. based, you know, where it's this big global, global organization. People just assume money is being mismanaged and many times it is. Um, but, you know, when you have these grassroots local organizations, they can they can put a face to it. Right. Like there's actual people in the community who are who are working towards something and then getting that U.S. support through that partnership is really key to funding it. So you kind of need both. You need that local organization, but you also need that U.S. presence to be able to really truly fund it in a way where donors feel comfortable giving, you know, to an organization out of the country. Absolutely. I, you know, and another organization that I'm more recently part of is called Influence Hers Foundation. Okay. And um, it is, there's two parts. There's a more travel and social component. And then there's the foundation, which I'm uh-huh. on the board of. And we give grants to um, micro grants to women owned organizations, nonprofits in the US and outside. Oh, and that cool. started with the founder was taking a trip around the world. Mm-hmm. And she is black and she went to Kenya. And the number of people there who she was working with an organization, they said, we never see people who look like us. Oh, wow. Look hearing. And so she created a mission to help women of color and allies do volunteer work in different countries, bring practical skills, but also do more. And so she works with uh, an organization in Kenya on the ground, um, teaching women and teenagers digital marketing skills. Wow. Blog posts, SEO, things that they can do to earn a really great living. And it doesn't matter where you live, you you, you know, maybe need to learn no English, but everybody is you lot in those countries. Um, yeah. But that really struck me of, yeah, it's, we all have to do our part, mm-hmm. but you also, it's also about like showing up and them being able to see faces that look familiar. And how do we do that? Um, because I think this is also great, but sometimes as Americans, we have the tendency to be Pollyannas and want to go in a place and solve everything. And yeah, it's that's not going to solve things for the long term. Mm-mm. Yeah. Well, you need you need a community mindset change, you know, and again, going back to the the book, you know, yeah. it has to be something where they see their own community members changing. And when they see that, that's when the real impact happens. It's not because they're told to do something. It's because they see somebody else doing it and they think that's what I want to do. I want to have a mindset, like a paradigm shift. And so it's a paradigm shift that starts in the community, not just in, you know, this is what you should be doing coming from, you know, a very rich American, you know, culture. (laughs) So very easy to say, you know, what other people should be doing when you're not in it. But 
Yeah. When they can see their own culture changing and they can see the the mindset of, of their neighbors and their friends changing, then that's where the difference is made. Yeah. Very cool. So, you know, this is taking a, a different tangent. And I love it because I feel like it really does circle back to branding because, you know, you have certain values and it is expressed in everything that you do. And, you know, your personal brand is this charitable, you know, amazing person, but you also understand the value of living with your why, you know, putting your why first. And, you know, that, that translates to your daughter, it goes to, you know, everything that you do within other organizations as well. And then being able to, you know, your corporate job helps other people see their why, and it helps them see their brand and build that. So that's, it's really cool. Yeah. Very cool. There's one thing on brand. Um, have you heard of the reflected best self exercise? No. What is that? So um, in, you can Google it, RBSC. It's okay. a, an exercise that I just had to do um, for one of my, because I'm also getting my MBA right now. And so for that, uh-huh. um, and um, you basically write stories about yourself, but then you ask people to submit stories about you. Oh, interesting. You get the stories back. And then out of that, we're creating action plans for a team leadership class. And it was, it really struck me mm-hmm. when I started reading stories that my partner, my s- siblings, my daughter, coworkers, people who used to work for me, people who are colleagues, directors. Um, when I saw the stories they wrote, yeah, I saw my brand very clearly expressed. And that made me feel so good. Because wow. I saw the the good parts and the bad parts, right? Like the sometimes over caring and doing too much and t- and like where I need to pull back, things that I already knew, but it just reinforced that I am showing up the way that I want to. I am being intentional in what I do. And I think that's a really great exercise for anybody to go through. Mm-hmm. Um, and just it, it can help you get a sense of who you are and also get those stories from people. Yeah. It's just a really beautiful way to share. So it I just really want to is. that. That is really cool. And, you know, recently I have an, I have an executive coach and she had done a 360 exercise and it's similar. That's like the corporate version of, of, you know, of what you're talking about is the the 360 and the 360 is when your employees review you right as a CEO. And that can be scary. (laughs) I'm not going to lie. It can be like, Oh gosh, what are they going to say? But you know, the, the key for me and what I, what I really um, took away from it is that I am, I'm living my brand, you know, like my actions are matching what I say. And when I, when I think about like how I want to show up as a CEO, it's, it's coming across to my employees in the same way, you know, like I'm not, I don't have this vision of me and how I'm going to be this, this great CEO. And then my employees get this very different version. (laughs) And so (laughs) <laughs> like that that can be scary. But I love that because when you're talking about a personal life and you know the people around you being able to share stories about you and how you're showing up in their lives, that would be really, really powerful. Yeah. I'm gonna try that. <laughs> so. Yeah. I it's something I never would have thought about, but it really was eye-opening also mm-hmm. and helpful for me to go, mm-hmm. okay, I see, you know, the things that I do have that I want to work on mm-hmm. that are like the the bad parts of the good parts. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so I'm glad like I'm on the right track. So. Yeah. Very cool. So what obstacles have you had to come overcome during your journey? Oh gosh. I know. <laughs> this is always like a loaded question. <laughs> um divorce. Uh-huh. The big one. Um yeah. I had work I was working, I was making six figures, then I got married and then I had, you know, got pregnant and decided to stay home mm. and became completely dependent on another person. Ooh. Um, second wife signed a horrible prenup mm. marriage fell apart. We were great co-parents now, but it was pretty rough and yeah. I had to start over and go back to work and realize like, I don't have my own retirement. I don't get, you know, I'm not yeah. being financially taken care of. So I have really have to build everything back up. And that's can be really scary when you're in your forties and you're doing this. And oh, yeah. mm-hmm. then we moved back to Los Angeles from Houston and I had a, I have had lived here before. I know people, but also not having had that work background and being a specialist in one thing because I applied for jobs. I'd worked in development for nonprofits. So I applied yeah. for those jobs, but I didn't have that specific, you know, I wasn't that specific. 
yeah. um, all kinds of jobs. And I had a really hard time finding something mm-hmm. until somebody finally got, gave me a contract for PR. And then during the pandemic, I started my own agency because I just started getting so many referrals and built up an agency. And that was really beautiful. But before that happened, I was, I had to go on food stamps because Mm -hmm. I spent all my money moving back. Mm -hmm. I left a business that was running in Houston. We ended up having to close it um, shortly after I left. And then the pandemic happened and it was a retail Mm. business and a social club. So, you know, that wasn't going to be happening for a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, And it was really hard to ask for help. And it was a moment I walked into um, a Walmart grocery store. I just dropped my daughter off at school and I was getting groceries and a bill had gone through that I wasn't anticipating yet. I thought it would go through a few days later after I'd gotten a check from you mm-hmm. know, some work. So I didn't have any money to pay for the groceries. Ugh. And I I was devastated and, you know, it hurts your ego a yeah. little bit. Yeah, it does. I used to be that person. Um, and I was going to walk out and the manager said, come here to pick out the things that you really need for you and your daughter. Like right now I'm being called to buy this for you. Wow. And that's really that, amazing. Yeah. I, I just, I'd never experienced that. And I was crying. I said, I'm usually the one who does this. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm usually the one who's, who's been in this position. It's yeah. very humbling and it's, but it's also really beautiful to realize that you have to be willing to accept help. Yeah. And so I, and so that moment I said, okay, I need to go on food stamps. I need to figure out what else I need to do while I'm d- looking for work. And luckily I had a couple of friends who hired me for contract work until the bigger jobs came in. Um, yeah. But that was a, that was a big moment. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I say this all the time because, you know, I've had, um, you know, I've been married and divorced and, and, you know, one of the one of the, the the big things that kind of was the straw that broke the camel's back in my divorce was, you know, my husband and I owned a business together and we were equal partners. In fact, I was 51%, he was 49%. And, you know, I have always been adamant that I need to always have my own money, always, mm-hmm. and own, my own credit. My, I mean, I've worked, been working since I was 13. I was raised by a single mom. I know how important <laughs> it is to not give up that financial independence. And so he and I were married and I was just kind of trusting him to manage all the finances and the business stuff. And, and I was working on sales. I was bringing in all the money right? <laughs> and then he was managing it. <laughs> and, and then I find out um, when we go to apply for a mortgage, we're moving back to Georgia and uh, we go to apply for a mortgage and the mortgage broker says, well, Angela is not going to be able to be on the mortgage because she doesn't have an income. And I was like, I don't what? <laughs> I was like, excuse me? And I was like, I don't have a what? Oh, no. And apparently he had put himself as head of household and me as a dependent. Oh, and no. and uh, yeah, so I wasn't on the deed. I wasn't on the mortgage. I mean, it was just, it was bad. And that was kind of like, uh, you don't know me at all if you think that this would be okay. And so- yeah, but I can't tell people enough, like, just make sure that you have something like, you know, if you're going to stay at home, force the nest egg, you know, like, make sure you have money set aside that is only your money. And, and at- don't use that for the extras, because that was my mistake. I did yeah. have. Yeah. And then I said, well, I'm not getting enough for the household budget. He's traveling yeah. all the time. So I'm going to have to use my money to supplement. Yep. And that's that was no, not yeah, that's the right your... <laughs> We also we had we owned a business together, um, real estate investment, yeah, and rentals and development. And I built it up from a small, mm. you know, a, a, he put the seed money in, but I built it up to a multi million dollar business. Yeah, and when we got divorced, I should have. I wish I had taken a step back and said, "I want this business. Don't worry about anything else." Yeah, right. Um, because then I would have had my little nest egg and my safety. And I was the one working yeah. on, I was the one person working in the business anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't, instead, I just said, okay, let, yeah, let's just liquidate everything. And that was, yeah. and that, that, that all that, that did was help delay me having to get a full-time job a little bit longer so that I could pay the bills and yeah. take care of my daughter before I made that transition. But yeah. yeah, people don't, you know, and 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 every time I hear about somebody who is trying to get divorced, but they're they've been a stay at home mom for a while, I'm like, oh geez, like you know, it, it's so dangerous, like you know, and and I just I encourage women to to just always have your own set aside, period, and that would be the condition for me to stay home is 
this money is my money. It sits in this account that my husband does not have access to. And it is my safety net because you need a safety net. You know, you just never know. I had a, a, a neighbor who her husband passed away unexpectedly. And then she comes to find out he never had life insurance and she was a stay at home mom. So you just don't know. And so you have to have some sort of a backup financial plan. So anyway, that's my soapbox and I'm going to get off of it now. <laughs> oh, I love it. This is, uh, these are the best conversations to me because we, yes, we're talking about business, but we're also, this is who we are. Yeah. And we have to our whole selves to everything mm, we do. It's yeah. the only way to be. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I agree. So, um, so yeah, I understand the divorce and having to rebuild because that can be one of the most challenging things. And, you know, especially if you're trying to rebuild in the way that you want to rebuild and you're trying to do it with quality and you're trying to do the right thing. And you're like, but I really need this money over here too. So maybe I should work part-time and do this. And, and then you're being torn in two directions and, you know, there's, there's just so much that goes into rebuilding when you come out of it. But you know, the, the accomplishments and the grace, if you can give yourself a little grace that, that goes a long way. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's where you have to really look at everything you're doing and mm. be willing to say no to things more yes. so that you pour more into yourself or like right now I'm pouring more into, I had a great, you know, job plus my own business plus yeah. teaching. And I realized I can't juggle all of these balls. Yeah. Uh, I was getting sick a lot. And I was like, I really need to go back to school and get this degree so that I can fulfill my, my dream of being a full-time professor, yeah. but also having my podcast business, also having my consulting, you know, but mm -hmm. on my terms. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. The, so I'm like, okay, this is a temporary sacrifice, but I know where it's going to end up mm -hmm. and I'm going to work really hard to get there. Yeah. So. And sometimes it's just saying no to the little things. Like, you know, I say no to phone calls. I don't do phone calls during the day. And that sounds really weird. But like when somebody calls the office, the automatic answer from my office manager is she's not available. I could be sitting three feet away and she's not available because phone calls are so disruptive. And if it's not a scheduled call, it derails me from what I'm doing. And I think there's there's some statistic where it takes you 20 minutes or something to get back to the same rhythm that you were in free phone call. And so like, to me, that disruption is just, I don't want to deal with it during the day. If you want to send me an email, great. If we feel like this needs to be a discussion, we'll schedule it. But I don't want to just have random phone calls throughout the day. And yeah. so like, that's just a, it's a me thing. And, and that, yeah, it, I just know it. it's for me, it's my way of providing that order and mm -hmm. not overwhelming myself. Yes. Yeah. I have my phone on do not disturb. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that <laughs> if phone calls come through. If I have, a, if I'm going to lunch or something, I'll check it. Yeah. But otherwise, if people really need to get a hold of me, you know, they can text me, they can email me, like you said. Yeah. Uh, but I, I try to really hold that space. I also try not to schedule meetings too early in the morning because mm -hmm. I know I'm not gonna be my best self. Yeah. Um, I want time to ease into my day to make sure my family's taken care of, that yeah. do all the other things I need to do before, so that when I get to my desk, I can just focus. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I I'm with you on that. Um, so as women, and I, I almost can answer this question, I almost know what you're going to say. But um, <laughs> so as women, we give our power away a lot, you know, whether it's, you know, not having an income, you know, or, or it's, you know, taking criticism, or it's somebody else um, kind of stealing our work and us not standing up for ourselves in some way. So can you tell me about a time that you gave your power away? And then another time that you stepped into your power? Yeah, so many. <laughs> so many I know examples. this is. Yeah, I understand. I, I would say that I definitely, when I had my PR firm and uh -huh. was building it, I had a couple clients I just trusted and did not make sure I had firm contracts with, and I even let my employees work for them extra. I'm uh. paying my team, right? And I felt like I needed to pay my team fairly, and I need to make sure they had benefits and all the things before myself. So I gave a lot of my power mm -hmm. away that way because, and it just put me into a situation where that person decided they weren't, uh, they lost a grant. They weren't able to pay. They decided, well, we didn't have a contract. I don't owe you anything. They decided wow. to play that game. I said, okay, you know what? I'm, I was on his wife's board of directors for her school. Um, I just said, all right, um, I'm going off of this, cutting all ties and I will, 
borrow money. I will figure out what's next, no matter how long it takes me to pay it back so I can pay my team, but I'm not going to do this again. And and I will say, I think that's, I tend, I've tended to give my power away to not trust my own instincts, to think I need a partner for work. Um, Place where I took my power back is last year I had moved into a great role with an agency that I'm still part of, but um, I realized that I couldn't fulfill the CEO's vision that we had, you know, the vision I'd come into the company for that we had agreed on okay. um, because it wasn't really where my heart was completely. I loved the mm-hmm. teaching, the podcasting, these other things that yeah. were really inspiring to me. And so we had to figure out a way to work together and we do, and she's an amazing woman and we work really well together. Uh, I just have a lesser role, but yeah. it works well for both of us. And it's given us a chance to like see each other in the best possible light to yeah. do together that we both are really love doing. Um, and that was a time when I had to just be realistic because I had to say, you know what, I'm getting sick every month. I'm mm-hmm. having these health issues. I'm not sleeping. All these other things are happening. So I know that my daughter is the most important thing to me, mm-hmm. um, most important person. And I am not going to sacrifice my relationship with her to work more and to not give her that time and intentionality. So I yeah. just had to say, all right, I'm still working. I'm just taking a step Mm -hmm. back from that. I have this other work that's really fulfilling and that's great. And that's monetizing. Um, And so that was a time when I finally had to just go. Yeah. It's uh, because otherwise I'd probably be in the hospital right now. (laughs) Like, well, and that's so important. It's so important because if you're not taking care of yourself and you're getting sick and you know, your daughter, you know, she needs you to show up um, at a hundred percent of you and not the, you know, what you have left, you know, like your daughter, like I I've been the same way. Like there was a time when my business was running me and I wasn't running my business. And I was, I was showing up with scraps of me to give to my child, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, <laughs> I've got to do better. This is not okay. So yeah, it, it took, it took a lot of, you know, me saying no and, and, you know, stepping into my power and saying, okay, this is where this ends. And I have to have these boundaries because if I don't create boundaries, nobody is going to create them for me. Yeah. yeah. And so, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. And I've been using that continu- continuously and even with teaching, being yeah. an advocate myself, saying, you know, what are, am I teaching next semester? How much am I teaching? Yeah. Um, because it can take a long time to find out what classes and it can be a little bit chaotic. Um, yeah. Even- university system, but I've, I've learned to really be an advocate for myself, still be kind, yeah. but be an advocate and say, here I am, here's my skill set. Hopefully you need it. If not, I will create something else that is another income stream over here. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's been a good lesson and I'm going to be 50 this year. And I feel like I'm just finally completely coming to my own. I know what I want to do when I grow up and I feel like I have a whole lifetime ahead to achieve I it. Love it. I uh, love it. Yeah, I can I can relate to that. I am I am approaching that as well. And I keep <laughs> telling myself, uh, you know, this is I'm 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 finally at a point where I'm so comfortable in my own skin that I can be authentic no matter what the situation. I don't feel like I have to put on a mask no matter what room I walk into, no matter how much more successful, no matter how much more powerful I think people are, I can still be authentically me and it's okay. And it took me a long time to get there. <laughs> so. It took a long time. And that's the thing I think we, you know, everybody thinks that you're in your 30s or your 20s. And that's like the pinnacle of being a woman. And no, you know, it when is you turn not. 40, all of a sudden you just feel stronger. And then now mm-hmm. you just keep going. And it's like, yeah, now I really, I, I am exactly who I always have been. Yeah. But now I feel comfortable expressing all of it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I agree. So what advice would you give to your 18 year old self? Oh, gosh. Um, not to not worry so much about, um, belonging, about thinking Mm. I had to like be a certain way to fit in. Yeah. Um, you know, not worrying so much about, am I wearing the right thing or am I talking to the wrong person to just, just do it, just Mm. be and explore and, and cut that out. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Then also to not get into that complacency of just trusting somebody else with the money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. letting myself get in that position again yeah yeah I can I can agree with you there so one last question I've really really enjoyed our conversation you have just been so delightful to talk to so what do you wish more people knew and you can answer that however you want oh my gosh (laughs) 
That's a hard question. It is one. It's yeah. a good one. <laughs> um, mm, I would, yeah, I'd have to go with either cooking or dancing. Yeah. Um, I love dancing in another life. I would be mm. a professional ballroom dancer. I love it. Um, yeah. I had to do that for an event in Houston. And it was one of the most fun few weeks of my life training to do a dance competition at an, a charity event. That's super um, cool. Yeah, that and just I love cooking. I love feeding people. Um, so th- my my other other life would be like running a bed and breakfast and making all the fe- meals for people and just pouring into that. That's awesome. That is awesome. Well, thank you so much, Annika. You've been such a pleasure to talk to. I've really, really enjoyed our conversation. Um, so where can people find you? Your brand amplified.com is the uh-huh. best place. You can find out, you can schedule time with me. Uh, you can listen to my podcast. You can see anything else that I'm doing, projects, sign up for the mailing list. Mm-hmm. And I'm always happy. You can also reach out to me on LinkedIn or other social media. I'm always happy to do a free strategy session with people. Very cool. No strings at all to talk yeah. about and or PR or marketing or digital or AI or podcasting or whatever you want to talk about. Very cool. I love that. I, I think that's a really generous offer. So um, any great advice, people should just jump on it. So, well, thank you, Annika Jackson, for all of your time today. You have been such a great inspiration and I am wishing you so much, so much success. So, so um, but uh, you can also find Annika on prettypowerfulpodcast.com and we will talk to you guys next week. Have a great day. Thank you for joining our guests on the Pretty Powerful Podcast. And we hope you've gained new insight and learned from exceptional women. Remember to subscribe or check out this and all episodes on prettypowerfulpodcast.com. Visit us next time. And until then, step into your own power.